Good morning. We will discuss Turkey's military presence in Syria in this program. More than a month since the Turkish military intervened in Syria's rebel-held northwest, and there is still little clarity about what Turkey is doing in Syria. This is the opening sentence of Sam Heller's essay titled Turkey Through the Syrian Looking Glass. This essay appeared on a US-based nonpartisan think tank, the Century Foundation's website last week. And Sam Heller himself is a Beirut-based freelance writer, analyst, and fellow at the Century Foundation. He joins us today via Skype. Good morning. Hi, Sam. Um, thank you. Uh, you know, our Turkish army uh, has stepped into Idlib uh, as part of the Astana process de-escalation plan. And it is agreed with Russia and Iran as well. But uh, in your essay, you, found, you say you found this uh, intervention problematic, and also it is based on a un politically unpalatable uh, compromise. Could you elaborate on this, please? Ben duyamıyorum yanıt arkadaşlar. Yayınımızda bir problem yaşıyoruz sesle ilgili. Sorry, we have a problem. We cannot hear Sam back. So we will be joining you in a minute. I would like to tell about Sam's essay, which we also translated into Turkish, and you can find it in our website. But Sam is back. Hi, Sam, again. Sorry for this uh, technical problem. Uh, my question was that, you know, uh, we know that Turkish army intervened in Syria, at, uh, especially the part uh, agreed by um, uh, to the Idlib part, northwest Syria, uh, as part of a Astana plan. And also it is uh, accepted by Russia and Iran. So, uh, but you also, uh, you find it, this intervention as problematic. Could you elaborate on that, please? Uh, Sam, uh, could you, yeah, we, we, we need your uh, headphone to be, uh, you know, you, you have to take off your headphone, please, we cannot hear you. Okay, okay thank you. All right, headphones are off. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, well, see, this is the thing, so we don't know what has been agreed. Okay, then... Uh, it's not totally clear who the parties to this agreement are. This is part of why there's been such a, a lack of clarity about Turkey's intervention in the Northwest. In theory, we have, uh, you know, the Astana framework has been agreed upon uh, between Turkey and Iran and Russia. Uh, and the assumption is that the three of them uh, arrived at some sort of, uh, some sort of compromise relative to Syria's Northwest, centered on Idlib. But the terms of this have not been publicized, and what has set, what has uh, kind of the shape of this Turkish intervention so far seems to have run counter to at least some of the provisions of Astana, uh, and then in particular uh, the idea that any sort of Astana de-escalation is meant to exclude and ultimately kind of target and eliminate uh, Jabhat al-Nusra uh, or Daesh, the self-proclaimed Islamic State. So what we have instead is that we have the, the evidence that we see on the ground, kind of the, the shape of this intervention as it seems to be happening. And we have uh, kind of some statements from Turkish officials, which at least in some instances do not seem to comport with, uh, with what's kind of really happening inside Syria. 
And we have statements from uh, Hayat Tahrir sham figures. Uh, and so Hayat Tahrir sham so this is the, the latest iteration, the newest version of Jabhat al-Nusra. And it is effectively Syria's uh, a former al-Qaeda affiliate. Uh, and so they haven't issued a collective position or clarification on, uh, on the terms of the Turkish intervention. Uh, but a number of their figures have come out in the media uh, and then have outlined roughly similar terms for how they understand Turkey's entrance into the Northwest. Uh, and so we're left as outsiders to try to make sense of what's happening. Um, and so far, it looks like, uh, you know, the, the, by all appearances, Turkey has entered the Northwest as part of an agreement, uh, a deal that was struck with Hayat Tahrir Shem, and uh, as part of an intervention that is not aimed, or that is not, uh, it's not oriented against Hayat Tahrir Shem. It is being conducted in coordination with uh, with this jihadist group. Yes, this is also um, this has been ta uh, talked about uh, in Turkish media and also other quarters as well. This point you made, uh, but to underline it, uh, you say that uh, the escalation plan does not involve any affiliates of Al Qaeda and. Uh, Hayat Tahrir al sham which Turkey seems to be coordinating with, uh, is is connected to Al Qaeda. Okay, um, and you say, but in your article that um, it seems at least plausible that Turkish intervention could be considered anti Al Qaeda, but not anti Tahrir al sham This, you know, the, the difference. How important it is. Well, it's tough to say, and it's, it's difficult to know if this is, um, if this, you know, to what extent this distinction is figuring into Turkey's strategic planning. Um, I don't know if this is uh, kind of a key objective for the Turkish military and the Turkish government intervening. Um, it does seem this this kind of distinction between Hayat Tahrir Shan and Al Qaeda. And the idea of potentially kind of driving a wedge between them, uh, to some extent, it does seem like it's happening. Uh, so whether that is uh, whether that is uh, part of the plan or just uh, just a, a, an, a, an apparent result of it, um, it looks like this is happening on the ground. Um, so what you have here, I mean, Hayat Tahrir Sham, so this, uh, it, it began as Jebet al-Nusra uh, last year, it changed its name to Jebet Feth Hashem. Early this year, it, it, uh, it became Hayat Tahrir Sham when it uh, kind of merged with or absorbed some other rebel factions. Over the course of that evolution and up to today, it looks like Hayat Tahrir Sham broke with Al Qaeda's international leadership. Uh, it looks like the this split was initially false, uh, but has, with time, uh, become real. Um, and so, what you're left with is a, at least a, a, a core leadership of Hayat Tahrir Sham, which is itself. I mean, these these leaders are dangerous people and kind of veteran jihadists, but who are at this point uh, seem to be in opposition to, or seem to have broken with Al Qaeda. And so what you have, uh, what the, the Turkish intervention seems to be doing is by interfacing directly, by linking up with Hayat Tahrir Sham's leadership, um, then it is exacerbating some of the contradictions and splits within the group, and it's alienating some of the veteran jihadists and, uh, and al-Qaeda loyalists um, who now, who had been previously kind of on the, the group's margins or periphery. 
uh, and who themselves object to cooperation with the Turks. So what's happening is that these people are being, uh, by all appearances, uh, alienated from and to some extent isolated in the course of Turkish intervention and Turkish coordination with Ayatollah Rishan. But these group of people that are uh, isolated or alienated, they are still in the same area, aren't they? And with the arms. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. So it's not clear what in practice that really translates into. Because these people, by all appearances, they're still floating around in the Northwest. Uh, they do still seem to, you know, have some sort of relationships with Hayat Tahrir Sham and to be kind of intertangled with it. Um, a handful were recently arrested by, uh, by Hayat Tahrir Sham, but it seems like they were arrested primarily um, not because they are Al Qaeda loyalists, but because of their persistent attempts to, uh, to kind of disrupt and split HDX as a group. Um, so, I don't know. So then what you, the, the, the concern then is that you don't necessarily end up with uh, a Northwest that is less jihadist. It just gets kind of scrambled and mixed up. And you just have sort of this, this stew of, uh, of now independent Al Qaeda loyal jihadists who are kind of floating around, uh, you know, adjacent to or maybe under, to some extent, under the auspices of, of HTS, of Hayat Tahrir Sham. Um, you describe Turkey's present deployment in Idlib as limited, um, that is enough to secure her core interests, which includes, you know, providing a buffer zone against the new uh, refugee flow and blocking Kurdish expansion. Uh, but it still falls short of, as you put it, preventing Idlib's collapse. Uh, could you explain what do you mean by Idlib's collapse? And what should uh, Turkey do to prevent it, or why should Turkey do that? I mean, by Idlib's collapse, I mean uh, uh, an external attack by the forces of the Assad regime and his international allies, um, which at this point I remain convinced is ultimately forthcoming. Um, it's not clear when, uh, but certainly uh, like Assad himself and the regime have consistently telegraphed that they, that they intend to retake Idlib the same way that they intend to retake the entirety of the country. Um, that remains the plan. Turkey's interests in the Northwest, as I understand them, core interests are uh, blocking further expansionism by the uh, by the Kurdish YPG. In this instance, from Afrin, uh, and then also preventing uh, preventing a, a major new flow of migrants uh, from Idlib into uh, towards the Turkish border and Hatay. Uh, in addition to, I think, also a sincere desire to uh, to guarantee, to some extent, the the, the well-being and the safety of uh, Syrians who are inside this opposition pocket. So what they've done so far, the limited deployment that they have is it's it's only the north end of Idlib, technically inside a level, uh, and it's on the the southern edge of. Uh, the southern edge of Afrin. So what we've done so far it seems like uh, in the event that, that it lived, kind of devolved into, uh, into chaos, there was a battle for the northwest, it looks like they could potentially prevent a land grab from Afrin by the YPG. And they may be able now to, uh, they may be positioned to set up a sort of a buffer zone inside Syria that could accommodate a, a major new flow of, of, of displaced people. Um, the Turk, uh, so, so the Turkish military has not deployed further south. So they haven't deployed along any of the active 
kind of lines of contact between uh, Hayat Tahrir Hashem led rebels and the forces of the Assad regime. Uh, and then this is key to, I think, credibly installing and maintaining a de-escalation zone. Um, the Turks are supposed to be policing or kind of at least observing one side of this line, and they're not there yet. Um, I think what they've done so far is supposed to be only one phase of many uh, in advance of you know, a, a, a a more expansive, multi-phase deployment, um, but the all, you know, but then the, these additional phases have not, uh, at least so far, have not materialized, um, and they may be difficult. I think they 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 likely require a kind of difficult kind of deal making and compromises both with uh, with other Astana guarantors with Russia and Iran, um, also likely with HTS itself. Um, so far, I think, and then uh, right now, it looks like the, the Turkish deployment is stuck at kind of the east end of the Afrin line, which is one real pocket of the northwest that is, that is controlled by something that is not HTS. Sam, what you um, have already said, uh, uh, they are very important. Uh, one point that the Assad regime's intention to retake Idlib soon, and secondly, that, that uh, Turkey is not uh, de being deployed in further south where uh, she should be if it is really a de escalation zone. But I will return to that uh, point. Before that, I would like to ask a little bit more about what's going on in Idlib, uh, this northwest area. Um, the Astana process is, you know, envisioned as a, um, you know, temporarily de escalate the conflict, uh, and uh, it doesn't involve, uh, it doesn't uh, expect the opposition groups there to build political and, uh, you know, governing structures. But uh, I understand from your essay, and we know that uh, in other area where Turkey also uh, deployed militarily. Um, in Idlib and northern uh, Aleppo, uh, you know, the Eurofit Europhi Shield zone, there are such structures, and at least one of them in the Eurofit Shield area um, that is openly supported by Turkey. Could you tell us about these governance bodies, and do you think they are, in a way, in, you know, Turkey's aim is, in a way, copying uh, PYD structures, the Rojova model, what's going on there? I don't think that they're necessarily a response to the, uh, the PYD kind of self-administration model. Um, I think that, I mean, what you're seeing is, and then I also think it's, it's difficult to kind of to identify where this fits into Astana. Because Astana can be a lot of different things. Uh, and when Astana started out, then it, uh, you know, it encompassed these four different de-escalation zones up and down Syria's, uh, western Syria. Um, since then, uh, it seems like the Astana kind of theoretical framework uh, has been used by Russia primarily to conclude a, a, a set of, of distinct, unconnected deals, that many of which don't actually involve other Astana guarantors. Um, and then some of which have, have actually, for example, in, uh, in the northern Homs countryside, the de-escalation there, or in the East Ghouta countryside, or in the uh, East Ghouta outside Damascus, then the de-escalation zones there, uh, on paper, have a role for opposition governance structures that, I guess, in theory, may ultimately be integrated into the kind of the Syrian state. Um, in the Northwest, it looks like what you see, what you have is kind of an evolution of the, the governance structures that sprung up in opposition-held areas over the course of serious uprising, um, which have typically been kind of these, these local administrative councils that exist at the, uh, the town or city level um, that have done kind of the, a lot of the grunt work of uh, administration and service provision. Uh, and then above that, uh, a set of directorates, kind of provincial or national level bodies that have 
you know, to varying extents, had had real kind of efficacy and and influence. Um, so I think that these you've had kind of roughly similar structures that have that have been present in opposition area, opposition held areas across the country. Um, I think what you're seeing now, you're seeing to some extent a a, a divergence between these two areas that are adjacent to Turkey. Uh, and it has something to do with the, the nature of Turkish influence uh, and kind of the, the, the shape of political power in these areas. So inside Euphrates Shield, you have a, a mix of these local indigenous structures uh, with a kind of a more, uh, let's say like a heavier Turkish hand, kind of more active, uh, more active management of administration and politics in these areas by Turkish authorities, whether that is the military uh, or kind of provincial authorities uh, in neighboring uh, in neighboring Turkey, um, and so you're seeing to some extent uh, kind of Syrian structures that have Turkish backing uh, and that are being shaped to some extent by Turkey. Uh, whereas inside the Northwest, what you have is you have a what is basically a um, like an HTS governance project, uh, which itself, you know, based on some kind of some some leaks, some reports that came out of Turkish media over this or this may uh, itself have been produced with Turkish encouragement. Uh, what you have there is the creation of what's called a, a salvation government, which is not only civilian, but which is understood to be backed up by HTS, uh, to which HTS has kind of grafted its own service administration uh, that is based in Idlib city, but has kind of reached across much of the province. Um, and in so doing, it's, it's an attempt to to kind of to rationalize and systematize uh, and governance and service provision in the uh, across Idlib. Uh, at the same time, I mean, the, like the real picture on the ground seems like it is more mixed and complicated than that. Uh, so if we have some service directorates that operate out of Idlib city uh, that enjoy that have other international backing and that so far seems to have remained autonomous. Uh, you have individual town level councils. Um, apparently have not been integrated into uh, um, into this this salvation government headed structure uh, you have kind of one uh, and then in particular yeah you have this one uh, this one pocket at like the north end of the northwest which is where kind of this is again where the Turkish deployment has stalled um, which is just outside HTS's control and then exists is politically independent of it. Um, so the real picture on the ground seems like it is substantially more kind of uh, complicated and unclear. Um, you also, I mean, to some extent, you also have a competition between the Salvation Government and the Syrian Interim Government, which was created several years ago. It's supposed to be uh, kind of the uh, the government for kind of all of Syria's opposition areas, but then historically been had kind of very limited influence and reach, uh, and that its head is based inside Euphrates Shield, but then it has some limited presence inside inside the northwest, um, you know, and then that is also kind of clawing for for influence and attempting to compete with uh, with these other bodies. Uh, uh, I don't know to what extent it, I mean, it doesn't seem like it, it's tough to discern a real sort of master plan here uh, by the Turks or by anyone else, frankly. Um, how many people are living in Idlib right now? And, you know, who are they? Uh, look, inside Idlib, it sounds like we have, I don't know if there's a, if it's possible to kind of, to really entirely nail it down, um, but I think we have more than 2 million people in Idlib and then adjacent rebel-held sections of the country. Uh, of them, 
uh, it sounds like roughly a million are displaced people uh, from all over Syria. Um, so some of these uh, some of these people have been there, uh, you know, kind of. Um, some of them got there earlier. Uh, many have come more recently. There's there's been a, a huge influx of people into the northwest as part of these uh, reconciliation and I mean reconciliation and evacuation deals uh, that have been concluded uh, further south, kind of in the the, the Homs and Damascus countryside, where. Uh, the Syrian government has pacified formerly opposition-held areas and then bust irreconcilable Syrians up to the northwest. Uh, so these million, uh, these roughly million displaced people there are extremely vulnerable. Um, and then uh, these are the people who are who are most in need in need of help, and then would be in the most kind of real. Uh, real danger uh, if things were to go wrong in the Northwest. Um, yeah. Oh, it's very interesting. Now we can go back. Uh, we can go back to what you uh, said earlier that uh, the regime's intentions to uh, retake Idlib with its, you know, one million uh, such people displaced and, uh, you know cannot uh, rejoin Assad's regime, and also two, uh, two million more. So do you, do you expect, uh, and also there is this Turkish presence there, even if it's not in the you know, southern part where they would be maybe directly uh, coming uh, face to face with the Syrian regime. Do you expect really uh, that uh, Assad's regime can do that? It's tough to know, frankly. I mean, I think at this point, uh, I think like the, the expectation among many is that the, the Assad regime would uh, would have a difficult time. That it would be they would be militarily challenging to retake the Northwest. Mm -hmm. um, I think that what we could say is that I mean, my kind of current working assumption is that. When the full force of the regime and its its Russian and Iranian allies, when all of this firepower is trained on any single target, um, then it is it's basically impossible for opposition forces to resist. Um, then they are going to lose. Uh, so in that sense, the the decisive factor here is it's essentially kind of a matter of timing and political will and choice. Uh, primarily, I think, by the, the regime's Russian backer. This is why it is, uh, you know, this is why it's important to see whether Russia can be satisfied uh, with, uh, with a, a de-escalation zone covering the Northwest. Um, this is the one, the one real hope of kind of enlisting Russian kind of sponsorship, either directly or indirectly, and then averting this sort of military uh, military conclusion. If there is an attempted offensive on the northwest, I think that. You know, I mean, it would likely be extremely difficult to, to totally kind of pacify and do the Northwest. In addition to these multiple millions of civilians, you do have substantial numbers of kind of committed rebel fighters, uh, including the Jahs, uh, who have nothing to lose uh, and who I think are, are in the main, who I think are ready to die. Um, and then who could, in theory, um, could also kind of benefit this mountainous terrain and then pivot towards more of like a like an asymmetric insurgent type of warfare um so i think that what you could have is maybe a, a province that is maybe impossible to fully pass up, but in which you know if if kind of russian air power really rained down on it would be nightmarish and deadly for the civilians uh, that are caught in the way um, this is something that would be, I mean, regardless of who wins or loses, I mean, the obvious loser would be the civilians, uh, and they would pay. It would be, it would be 
you know, kind of terrifying and deadly for them. Actually, uh, unfortunately, we have seen that this could be dared uh, throughout this uh, war in Syria, especially in Aleppo, I remember. So, you know, it's impossible maybe to say that uh, with such a huge number of civilians in, you know, in such a position, they wouldn't do that. No, we cannot say, can we? No, I don't think we can. I mean, I don't think that, I mean, frankly, I don't think that, um, I don't think that most of the parties to this war are motivated primarily by the well-being of civilians. Okay. So, uh, certainly not, certainly not, you know, the Assad regime and its allies. I don't, I don't think that that is kind of at the top of their mind. Um, some of these other considerations, as I, as I wrote about in this article, the other considerations about maybe just kind of the, the practical difficulty of successfully kind of pacifying this area, maybe that will, maybe that will lead them to, uh, I don't know, to looking for like a more managed, uh, negotiated solution with Turkey's help. Exactly. Um, uh, that is the hope at this point. Exactly, and uh, maybe Turkey would be willing to do that, but the question is uh, in exchange of what? Uh, from that, I'm leaving it open and uh, ask, would, I would like to ask you about uh, the Afrin part, which, you know, Turkish army, we have news that, yeah, that we could expect Turkish army could move into Afrin area. Uh, we cannot know, of course, if they will do that. Uh, can you comment on that? And also, can you comment on the possible consequences of such a move? I, don't know. I mean, I don't think I can say definitively whether or not Turkey will uh, will attack Afrin. Uh, I mean, obviously, I think the, you know the Turkish government and military, they're probably the only ones we know here. Uh, I think I can say that, uh, you know, the Turkish political leadership has repeatedly threatened to, uh, to attack YPG-held areas, uh, and then these threats have not materialized. Uh, so whether it is Tel Abyad or whether it is Tel Rafat, um, inside kind of on the, the edges of, uh, or whether it's Manbij, on the edges of the Euphrates Shield zone, um, these attacks have not happened. Uh, my impression is that, like these these operations have been have been telegraphed as uh, as negotiations have been ongoing, uh, as Turkey has been lobbying other international powers for a, a, a go ahead to attack these areas, um, which at least so far seems like it has not has not uh, has not been forthcoming. Uh, I think that with with Afrin, uh, you know, I think that certainly some of these noises, I think that they, I would be surprised if Turkey gets Russian approval to attack Afrin. I don't think that Russia would allow that. And I think that in this instance, then it is, uh, the Russian decision is what makes the difference. Um, At the same time, I think that this, this looming Turkish threat actually, I think that that is a useful thing for Russia. Uh, I think that it's probably handy for Russia to be able to kind of to brandish this Turkish threat uh, and then to use that as leverage against, uh, against the YPG elsewhere in the country potentially. Um, because I think that this uh, kind of the, the relationship between Russia and the YPG and then whatever kind of ongoing dialogue and negotiations that they're having, this is something that spans the country. It's much bigger than a free. Uh, and so it reaches as far east as, as Deir Ezzor, for example. And I, I, I think that it's possible that the Turkish threat to Afrin is part of that, that it figures into Russia's negotiations, Russia's uh, kind of back and forth with the YPG. This is most insightful. Um, last question, we have to wrap up. Um, do you think, uh, will U.S. Uh, choose Turkey over uh, PYD as Ankara always demands? 
I think, I mean, it seems so far that the the Americans are trying to avoid that side of that sort of binary either or choice. I don't think they want to have to choose. Um, if it did come down to one or the other, I think that the Americans would choose the Turks. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the YPG is for America, I mean, the, the language with which they describe it is uh, it's a valued partner in the campaign against, uh, against ISIS or ISIL or Daesh, whatever you want to call it. Whereas, I mean, Turkey is a strategic ally. Strate Turkey is, is more important to the United States. And then however kind of fraught or damaged that relationship is, I don't think that that, I don't think that relationship and that alliance is really going anywhere. Um, at the same time, I, I don't think that, at least for now, it doesn't seem likely that the United States is going to abruptly abandon uh, the YPG or kind of withdraw from these areas, uh, at least not imminently. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's tough to know what America will do in part because the American policymaking process is not functioning properly. Um, and so a lot of the messaging that you see out of the Americans, whether it's from the president or from the military or someone else, this is not properly coordinated. Uh, and I, I would recommend against reading it as kind of the product of a, a single, a coherent decision-making process. Um, but I think at this point, it seems likely that the, the Americans will stick around, at least in the near term in the Northeast, uh, in these YPG-held areas, in an attempt to, to leverage that American presence into a, a kind of a comprehensive political solution for serious war. And that, you know, in the meantime, they will just try to, to manage and, and uh, this, their, their relationship with Turkey in parallel with that. Um, Thank you. To, 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 Thanks. Sam Haller, thank you very much for this mind opening and resourceful interview. Uh, we will be, you know, taking, uh, looking at your articles. We will be <laughs> and in touch. Thank you very much. Sure, thanks for having me. Yes, uh, we, are, we are wrapping up, and uh, Mediascope TV's transmissions and programs will be on air throughout today. Thank you.